finishing, <coughs> excuse me, finishing up um, Faulkner's Barn Burning. We're on page, we left off on page 413 towards the bottom. Let's um, kind of recap the setting. So Abner Snopes dragged Horston on the rug. Major de Spain ordered him to clean the rug of stains. Okay, Abner did. He also ruined the rug in the process of cleaning the rug of stains. Okay. So Major de Spain charges him against his contract. That is, when, when he entered into this contract to share crop for Major de Spain, Abner agreed to produce a certain number of bushels of grain, corn in this case, that we're told, all right? We're never told what that number is. Now, Major de Spain is altering the contract so that Abner has to produce an additional 10 bushels of corn. The implication of that is, let's say the, the acreage would naturally produce something like 100 bushels. And Abner, as part of the contract, would be allowed to keep 15 of those. Now he's only allowed to keep five. Okay? So he's, he's losing a lot on this. <clears throat> Abner doesn't like this uh, rewriting of the contract. You know, if you're a member of Amazon or Netflix or something like that, or even your cell phone provider, what can they do without your agreement? They can change the contract. They can change the terms of the contract, and you have no say in the matter. Can you turn the tables, change the terms of the contract? Can you tell your cell phone, cell phone provider that beginning such and such day, such and such month, I'm only going to pay you X number of dollars a month? No, you can't. Your cell phone will immediately be cut off, okay? Think about contracts. So what does Abner do? We didn't, I didn't address this the other day, but it's kind of brought out on bottom of 413. Yeah, kind of 412 and 413. When the story opened, Abner was on trial, right? Who brought a charge against him? A character named Mr. Harris. Abner, in a legal sense, won that trial because the justice of the peace said, I can't fight against you. Who brought the charges in this trial? Abner Snopes did. The guy's got you know what? I mean, he's, he goes and charges Major to Spain, who is a, apparently, very large landholder in this county, which means he's powerful, he's rich, Right? Abner takes him to court for changing the contract. And we're told, bottom of 413, the, in this part we address, so I'll, I'll go over it very briefly again. The justice says, you claim 20 bushels of corn is too high for the damage you did to the rug. Notice Abner's response. Abner's response. <clears throat> he brought the rug to me, said he wanted the tracks washed out. I washed the tracks out and took the rug back to him. Clear as day. Remove the tracks, return the rug. Okay. The justice says, Notice, Major Despain doesn't, you know, objection, Your Honor, or something like that. The justice says, but you didn't carry the rug back to him in the same condition it was in before you made the tracks on it. Now, if Abner had a good defense lawyer, what would the defense lawyer say at this moment? But that's not what he asked me to do, Your Honor. He didn't say, return it in the condition it was before I tracked the poop on it. 
Should be open, shut case. Abner doesn't respond. Why? Because the judge has him. Abner's, Abner doesn't think quickly enough. Okay. And now for perhaps half a minute, there was no sound at all save that of breathing. And so the judge said, you decline to answer? The judge's meaning is, well, if you can't answer that, then you're obviously guilty. I find against you, Mr. Snopes. Okay? You were responsible for the injury that made you to stay his rod. But then what does the judge do? So Abner brings charges against Major Despain. Abner loses. What is the judge solely required to do? Now, get the sheriff to enforce the law, or whoever. What should the judge solely on the basis of law do? He's charging you for 20 bushels of corn. That's what you owe. That's what justice demands. But what does the judge do? 20 bushels of corn seemed a little high for a man in your circumstances to have to pay. Major to Spain claims it cost $100. October corn will be worth about 50 cents. 50 times 20, 100. Okay? 50 cents times 20. <clears throat> I figure that if Major to Spain can stand a $95 loss on something he paid cash for, you can stand a $5 loss. So Major to Spain wanted 20 bushels of corn to pay me essentially for the damages to the rug. Is that going to fix the rug? Obviously not. This is a, a moral lesson. He's trying to teach after. Don't break other people's stuff if you can't pay for it. What does the judge do by cutting that amount in half? Or, put it this way, what does he show to Abner? That we also saw the justice of the peace in the beginning of the story, and Mr. Harris in the beginning of the story, show to Abner's son, Sardi. Kindness. Compassion. There's another term that's not often used in connection with the law, but it is very much in connection with the law. Mercy. This is where the judge shows mercy to Abner. Okay? How does Abner respond? I don't mean initially. Within the course of the story, how does Abner respond? He burns down Major to Spain's barn. That's his response to an act of mercy or kindness. Okay? So, they leave the town or store where the court is being held. And sorry, he starts, you know, we're not going to pay this. And the father essentially tells him to shut up. So, they go off home. It's after sundown, we're told, page 414. They eat supper by lamplight. Sardi is sitting out on the doorstep, enjoying what? A moment of peace and quiet, listening to the whippoorwills and the frogs. So he hears these birds singing, and he hears the frogs croaking, and it's like the beauty of nature in early summer, late spring. He's not inside where there's all the tension. Until he hears his mother's voice, his mother's voice. Abner, no, no, oh God, oh God, Abner. And he's like, here it comes again. He goes inside. His father tells him, go get that can of oil that you were using to grease the wagon with. Sardi already knows what's going to happen. I know what he's going to use this can of oil for. He doesn't move. And his father says, Are you, the, the boy says, What are you, come on, get that oil. Abner finds, uh, excuse me, Sardi finds himself running to the barn. And we're told, top of 415, middle of that paragraph. Now take that back. Beginning of that paragraph. 
He was moving, running outside the house toward the stable. This, the old habit. The old blood which he had not been permitted to choose for himself, which had been bequeathed him willy-nilly, and which had run for so long, and who was where, battening on what of outrage and savagery and lust before it came to him. Is Sardi literally thinking this? Not necessarily. What is being, what are we being told by that passage? This again, the old fierce pull of blood. Notice the language that's used. The old habit, the old blood, which he didn't get to choose. What did none of us get to choose for ourselves, for our lives? Who we were born to in what family we were born, in what city, what country. None of us got to choose to be born, right? Goes without saying. Which had been bequeathed to him willy-nilly. What's that mean? Flip a coin. Page 413 in the 11th. What is Faulkner saying? It's pure chance, folks. Sardi could have been born to whom? According to pure chance. Major to Spain. How would his life be different? He wouldn't have moved 12 times in 10 years. Because it's kind of implied, Major to Spain is stable. He's not a whack job. Abner's what? Louder? Yeah, he obviously, he's a whack job. What else? What term do we use to describe people who kind of like to hurt other people? Sociopath? Psychopath? At the very least, he's a pyromaniac. He likes to burn. Okay? And the boy thinks, this, this is now when we're told what he actually literally thinks. I could keep on. He hasn't gotten to the barn yet. He's like, I could go past the barn and I could just keep on going. I could run on and on and never look back, never need to see his face again. Only I can. Why? Thing that pulls him back. And notice, you know, the old habit, the old blood, the old fierce pull of blood. Is that just the, the pull of his immediate father or the habit? The habit caused by his immediate father? I don't think so. I think Faulkner's saying, you know what? There are parts of our internal makeup that come from our parents, their parents, their parents, their parent. That's why some people put a whole lot of stock in their family name. Kennedy, Bush, etc. Because they go back a long ways. Only I can. I can. And now he has the can in his hand. Notice, we're not told. He gets into the barn, he goes in, he stops, he finds the can, he picks it up. He just suddenly finds it there. He's unaware of having picked it up. Have you ever driven someplace and you get there and you realize, I don't remember how I got here. When I used to drive back and forth across the country, I lived in San Jose, California. I went to school outside Chattanooga. I would do that nonstop. No, no stopping for sleep or anything like that. 2,600 miles, 36 to 39 hours, depending on how fast I went. There were long stretches of Interstate 40 when I would, you know, seemingly, not literally, black out. I, I don't remember going through Tucumcari, you know, New Mexico or something like that. He goes back into the house he gives the, and he says, aren't you even going to send someone? I'm not going to use the word that he uses. 
at least before you sent someone. Meaning, you gave them a warning. You gave them a chance. Okay? Father doesn't strike them. Instead, he grabs them. Tells the older brother what to do. And then the father says to his wife, Hold him. His wife's sister goes, not you. Lenny, take hold of him. I want to see you do it. And she grabs Sardi by the wrist. <laughs> you better hold him better than that. If he gets loose, what's he going to do? Or actually what he says is, if he gets loose, don't you know what he is going to do? He's going to run up yonder, that is up to the big house, and tell them what I'm doing. What's he suggesting is going to happen if she lets Sardi loose? He doesn't give us the series of consequences, but they're implied. What's going to happen? If he tells them, I'm going to get caught. That's one possible consequence. What's another one? If he tells them, I'm going to get killed. Either way, what happens to Lenny and her daughters and her sister? Who provides for them now? This is not 2024. This is early 1890s. Most women don't work outside the house. I'll hold them. See you do it. And the boy starts struggling. He says, I want to have to hit you. And the aunt says, let him go. If he don't go before God, I'm going myself. Why? This has got to stop. How many times, I mentioned it a couple minutes ago, how many times have they moved in 12 years? Excuse me, 10 years? The boy's only 10. They moved 12 times. What does that imply? Twelve barns have been burned. He can't, <laughs> it's not that he can't keep a job. It's that he can't keep a place where he keeps a job. Somebody does something, what does he do? Because of his latent, ravening ferocity and the rightness of his own convictions, you say something that ruffles Abner's feathers, woof, your place burns to the ground. What your barn does. Sardi runs. And his mother says, no, 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 help me. He runs. He goes to the house, bangs on the door, cries out, Despain. He sees Major Despain coming from a doorway outside, uh, down the hallway. So Sardi's actually in the house for a moment. And he says, Barn. Barn. What the hell does that mean? Barn. What? Barn? Yes. Barn. And Sardi turns and runs. He runs and he hears to Spain say, my horse, fetch my horse. Sardi keeps running down that long driveway. He hears the horse come thundering past him. He moves out of the way so that he's not run down. Middle of paragraph 416. We're told. He keeps running. Need must in a moment more find him wings, waiting until the ultimate instant to hurl himself aside into the weed-choked roadside ditch as the horse thundered past and on for an instant in furious silhouette against the stars. The tranquil early summer night, which even before the shape of the horse and rider had vanished, strained abruptly and violently upward. A long, swirling roar, incredible and soundless. Why did the night, we're told, uh, strain abruptly and violently upward? What does it mean if it's pulled up? What does Sardi see? Probably. How do you get rid of the night? I mean, you don't glitter it, right? But you shine a light on it. 
What light is being shined, so to speak? You ever been to a big bonfire? Not barn fire, bonfire. You got a big old mass of sticks, you know, or wood. From here to here, piled this high. You soak it with gasoline. You stand back. <laughs> you throw a match or something into it, and what does it do? Woof! Big flame. We're talking a barn. Like any barn you can see driving around Rutherford County. A lot of light. The night goes away because he's so bright, right? He keeps running, and he hears, a moment or two later, hey, we're in the middle of Nowheresville, Mississippi. That retort from that gunshot is going to echo and echo, and then two more. What does his saying, pat, pat, imply? What do the three gunshots imply? His father and brother are dead. Okay? He keeps running. At midnight, he's on the crest of a hill. Okay, when did this action begin? Shortly after sunset. 6.30, 7 o'clock, it's early May. Not much time has passed from the beginning of the story to now, maybe a week at most. So how long has he been running? Five hours? And we're told there's no glare behind him. If you're out in the middle of Mississippi, I lived in Mississippi for four years working on my PhD. If you're out in the middle of the flats of Mississippi, like over near Starkville, okay, where Mississippi State is, man, there's nothing there. It, my daughter thought of going to vet school there. Best program in the country, I'm going, but yeah, you gotta go to Starkville though, man. I mean, that's like punishment. But if you've got a single barn out there in the middle of the countryside and you light it, you can walk for miles and still see the fire this is telling us how far Sarge has gone. Because he's up on a hill, which gives you a higher vantage point, and he doesn't even see the glare. Not because the fire has burned down. It's because of how far he has traveled. And he thinks, my father, he was brave. He was, he was in the war, he was in Colonel Sartori's cavern. Which of course we know he wasn't. Not knowing his father had gone to that war, a private in a fine old European sense. Wearing no uniform, admitting the authority of and giving fidelity to no man or army or flag. Going to war as Malbrook himself did for booty. That is, to get what he could out of it. Troops come to a town, they destroy a town, they you know, kill all the enemy, and there's houses still standing by. What do the troops do? They go in, they pillage the house. That's what Abner did. Only we know the kind of pillaging Abner did. He stole horses. Okay? And we're told as he sits there, the constellations go by. The stars are moving. The earth is moving, literally. He hears the birds. The night is now almost over. And the last paragraph, the last sentence, second to the last sentence, page 417. He went on down the hill towards the dark woods within which the liquid silver voices of the birds called unceasing. He goes down the hill, we're told, toward the dark woods, and he hears the birds in the woods, and it's like they're calling to him, coming through the woods. The rapid and urgent beating of the urgent inquiring heart of the late spring night. Quiring means singing. The late spring night, the heart of the night is calling him. Calling him where? Forwards, onwards. It's not calling him where? Backwards. This 
not done away with. But he's broken what? The tie. He's broken the rope. It's not a literal rope, obviously. But does that mean he escapes all the effect and influence of his father and his father's father? No. That's still there. Okay? So what is, at the very least, one of the things Faulkner is raising in this story is this idea of morality, conscience. Your father, your parent, authority figure, whatever, tells you to do one thing, and what does every person have to do? they got to make a decision. Do I follow that? Or do I do what Sardi, it's implied throughout the story, knows what is right. The opening scene, the trial. He aims for me to lie, his father, and I will have to do it. Later that evening, his father says, you were going to tell me the truth, weren't you? He doesn't answer. Smack. <laughs> yes. Showing us the break has already occurred. Now it just has to be lived out, fleshed out. Where do we see the break really occur when Sardi goes and warns Major to spare him. He knows what he's doing at that point. He knows my doing this can result in my father's death. Okay? All right. Turn from there to Flannery O'Connor. We won't finish, finish O'Connor's. A good man is hard to find today, but we'll get a good ways into it. It's on um, 361 in the 11th edition. A couple of things about O'Connor. She's Catholic. Okay? She's devoutly Catholic. In the Deep South. In the 30s and 40s and early 50s. There are very, very few Catholics in the Deep South. Outside Louisiana. Because Louisiana has French influence. And France at the time, when it was settling Louisiana, was entirely Catholic. Okay? But Georgia, Alabama, mm, very, very few Catholics. Okay? In one of her letters, and I don't remember. I didn't include it in the syllabus. In one of her letters, she explains to an inquisitor who's read some of her stories, that she writes the way she does because she's Catholic. What do I mean the way she does? There's an emphasis in Southern literature, or maybe not an emphasis, there's a use in Southern literature of what is called the grotesque. The, the grotesque image or a grotesque person. It's a thing really outside the ordinary. It's, it's, a, it's a thing or person that is designed to shock you. Okay? Barn Birdie. What's their grotesque? Abner. Okay? In this story, it's going to be the character of the misfit. There's another story in here. Can't remember which one it is, but it features a one-legged Bible seller. The fact that he has one leg, that's the grotesque thing. He has a prosthetic device, but someone steals it temporarily. So he's, you know, here hopping around and stuff. Okay? It's designed to draw our attention to an aspect of the character in the society. One other thing about her. She contracted lupus at an early age. Lupus is an autoimmune disease. Okay? She died at 39. She'd written four or five novels, a couple of collections of short stories. One of the collections of short stories and one of the novels weren't published until after her death. If she hadn't died, 
she probably would have lived to, you know, be the greatest 20th century American writer, probably would have won a Nobel Prize, right? But what she likes to do is she likes to put people in these situations that force them to really see themselves, right? Now, a good man is hard to find. What does that title mean? And what does the title have to do with the story? We're going to hear a character in the story, a guy named Red Sammy Butts, all right, who's going to say, a good man is hard to find. And somebody else is going to say, yep, yeah, sure he is, etc. But I think it's more than that. I think she gets the basis from this. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19, verses 16 and following, which, very briefly, say, A man came to him, to Jesus, and said, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? What must I do to be saved? Okay? Jesus says to him, I'm paraphrasing the King James Version. Jesus says to him, why callest thou me good? Why are you calling me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Who the hell do you think you are calling me good? No man is good. Only God is good. Okay? I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. So, he says, you want to enter into eternal life? Follow the commandments. He says, which ones? Like, is this a, you know, do I just have to get 50% on the final in order to pass? Which ones? Jesus says, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, honor your parents, love your neighbor as yourself. Done them all. I can check all these off. I'm perfect when it comes to these. And then we're told, Jesus says, if you will be perfect, Go sell everything you have, okay? give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Okay? He's not willing to give it all up for Jesus. He's not willing to, to use another passage from Christ, take up his cross and deny himself. Right? Go back to the good master part. Why does Jesus reply, there is none good but God? I think this is, Je and I could be entirely wrong here, okay? But I think this is Jesus saying to this, in, a, in one of the other gospels, he's called a rich young ruler, saying to this young ruler, way to go. You recognize you called me good because you see that I am who I say I am. All right? Why is that important? Wait till we get to the end of the story. And the old lady in the story, the grandmother, has a rather long conversation with the misfit. All right? The antagonist of the story. Bear in mind, what does the word misfit mean? If you have a shoe that misfits, then what? It doesn't fit. It doesn't belong. Kind of like lone wolf. The misfit doesn't fit with what? Society. How do we know? He's a mass murderer. Okay? The story opens. The grandmother didn't want to go to Florida. She wanted to visit some of her connections in East Tennessee. And she was seizing it every chance to change Bailey's mind. So we're told right there, she'd rather go to Tennessee. Why? She wants to see some of her connections. At a later point, it's called family and connections. She wants to see family and friends. All right? She doesn't want to go to Florida. Bailey's sitting there, edge of his chair, reading the orange 
sport, uh, the sports section of the Atlanta Constitution and Journal. And she's standing next to him, holding the paper, we're told, one hand on her hip, and rattling the paper over his head. Now, see you, baby. Now, over his head can't mean just like this over, or can mean she's rattling him on the head with the newspaper. Here this fellow calls himself the misfit. He's loose from the federal pen, headed toward Florida. You read here what he says he did to these people. Just you read it. I couldn't take my children in any direction with a criminal like that, loose in it. Couldn't answer to my conscience if I did. We're here, where it's here, by the way. Where does the story begin? We're told. It's in Atlanta. They're going to try to drive to Florida. Okay? What is between them in Florida. Obviously, it's a big area of all of South Georgia. But somewhere between them and Florida is this character, the misfit. She goes, I wouldn't take my children anywhere where he is. I couldn't handle it. My conscience couldn't take it. We could jump to the end of the story. Why? Because it's because of her, literally and figuratively, that they are exactly where the misfit is. Okay? This is an example of what's called irony. It's situational irony. Okay? So, Bailey doesn't look up. So she wheels around and then starts addressing the children's mother. So, we have Grandma Bailey, her son, his wife, a baby, baby, two children, June Star, and John Wesley. We don't know which of the son and daughter, June Star, and John Wesley, is the oldest. It doesn't matter. Wife is never named, baby is never named, grandmother is never named. The only ones who are named of the family are Bailey, June Star, and John Wesley. When Bailey doesn't respond to her, she turns to the children's mother and starts haranguing her. She doesn't respond. Okay? And she says, children have been to Florida before, grandmother. You all ought to take them somewhere else for a change so they would see different parts of the world be broad. Tennessee. Different parts of the world from Atlanta. It's an hour and a half, folks. You're not going to get broad. You're not going to get educated by going to Tennessee from Atlanta. But she thinks you will. They never have been to East Tennessee. We're not talking Dollywood. We're not talking Gatlinburg, because that's nowhere at this point. All right? And by the way, to get from Atlanta to East Tennessee, or to get from Atlanta to Florida, what do they not have to drive on? There's no Interstate 75. Stories written in 1953. Eisenhower doesn't begin the interstate system until 1955. Like I-40, I-24, I-95, I-75, I-80. You know, um, odd number of things go north-south, even number go east-west. Why did he do that? Because when he got in Europe, World War II, he saw Germans were smart. Hitler created the Autobahn for one, word, for one reason, to be able to move war material quickly from one place to another. Okay? And he said, we don't have that. We need to have that in case anyone tries to invade us. So, John Wesley says, in response to the grandmother, because the mother doesn't say anything, until we get to the midway in the story, she does say a few words. John Wesley says, if you don't want to go, go to Florida, why don't you stay at home? June Star replies. She wouldn't stay at home to be queen for a day. I don't know about you. Most students kind of give me the same reaction. If I had spoken like that about 
either of my grandmothers in their presence, I would either not be sitting for a week or I'd have a palm print on the side of my face for probably about a week. What does that, we don't need anything else. What does that show us about these two children? How would you describe them? Brats? Yeah, they're brats. They're not well behaved. They're not disciplined. Okay? So she said, yeah, well, what would you do if you met up with this misfit? John West had smacked his face. June Star, she wouldn't stay at home for a million bucks. Afraid she'd miss something. She has to go everywhere we go. Ooh. Out of the mouths of babes. What did June Star just tell us? That she feels, and the implication is probably the rest of the family feels. Grandma is always with them. They never get any freedom from her. And how has she been described so far? Just bitching and moaning and complaining. Okay? So, next morning, even though she doesn't want to go to Florida, what's the grandmother doing? She's the first one in the car. She's dressed all nicely. Okay? She has a box with her cat in it because she doesn't want to leave it home because she's afraid it might accidentally turn on the gas burner. Her husband, her father, excuse me, her son doesn't like the cat. He doesn't want the cat coming. So she gets in the middle of the back seat, two older kids on either side of her, the parents and the baby in the front seat, the mother's holding the baby. Why? Why not a car seat? It hadn't been invented yet. This car doesn't even have seat belts yet. And we're told what she is dressed in, colors, all that kind of stuff. Why? Last paragraph on page 362. Because in case of an accident, anyone seeing her dead on the highway, would no one wants that she was the lady. That's foreshadowing. Foreshadowing, you know, you get an indication of something that's going to happen. Well, what's going to happen? They're all going to die to give it away. But at least people will know she was a lady. What's going to tell people that? How she appears. Is being a lady dependent upon what you wear? Is being a gentleman dependent upon what you wear? O'Connor is suggesting, no, not really, okay? So they drive on. John Wesley, top of 363. Let's go through Georgia fast so we won't have to look at it much. The grandmother doesn't like that. If I were a little boy, I wouldn't talk about my native state that way. Tennessee has the mountains. Georgia has the hills. John Wesley, Tennessee's just a hillbilly dumping ground. Wow. And Georgia isn't any better. Georgia's a lousy state, too. Grandmother, in my time, children were more respectful of their native states and their parents and everything else. What's meant by everything else? Probably grandparents. Okay? People did right then. What does she mean, did right then? Look at the very next thing that's they're driving, they see a house, they see a naked little black boy standing in the doorway, I think it is, okay? <coughs> Pointing to the Negro child standing in the door of a shack. Wouldn't that make a picture now, we're told? And they all turn and look at him. And June Star, he didn't have any britches on. Grandmother, probably didn't have any. Little black children in the country don't have things like we do. If I could paint, I'd paint. Why? Again, who's the narrator? Who's telling that? Who is saying that? The old grandmother. What is she prefaced? She began that whole scene with what? In my day, meaning back when I was young. What's the implication? 
This is a picture of a bygone age. This is how it used to be in the good old days. The little black kids didn't have clothes to wear. What is this telling us about her? What word would we use today? She's a racist, man. Of course she is. This is Georgia, deep Georgia, in maybe 1953. I kind of think it's probably set around 1950, maybe just a little bit earlier. She's harkening back to, and we're going to hear reference to it in a moment, Gone with the Wind. My wife's family's from southern Georgia. I'm related to the Sherman that burned Georgia. You know, when I first met them, she was like, you just don't want to talk to them about that. Just leave that, leave that alone, because, you know, that whole Civil War, Deep South, it's still called what? Anybody know? The War of Northern Aggression. I mean, I was teaching, I should go there because we don't have time. My first year here, teaching a comp course. And I was trying to get students to think and stuff, and I had this white guy from Virginia. And we got to talking about a variety of things in class. And he wrote a paper on what he called the uh, American Triumvirate of, he didn't use this term, but I'm going to use it, of evil rulers. Triumvirate, three rulers, <coughs> three presidents. Uh, who were they? Lincoln's. remember who the other one was. They were evil. Why? Because of how they treated blacks. And I, you know, I, I remember reading that. And the next day I went in and, and spent about five minutes just haranguing the KKK. I mean, and this kid, I'm not kidding. If he had them on him, I'd be riddled with daggers. I mean, he was just shooting bullets at me. Right? It's, it's, it's still around pretty clear. So, they keep going on, and they see the graveyard. Middle of page 363. Okay? They pass a cotton field with five or six graves fenced in the middle of it. One, two, three, four, five, six. Five or six graves in the middle of a cotton field. It's foreshadowing. They go on, and the grandmother says, that was the old family burying ground. That belonged to the plantation. John Wesley, where's the plantation? Gone with the wind. Making reference to the book, and by that time, the film also. In other words, it has been destroyed, like all the other great things of the old South, you know. They keep talking and playing, and... She talks about a man she was courted by, etc. They stop to eat at the tower. Red Sammy's. Red Sammy's famous barbecue sausage. They get there, and Red Sammy's underneath the car fixing it. They go inside. They order their meal. Red Sammy comes in, page 364. Red Sam's wife is the one doing the waitressing. And she says... Just past the middle of the page, 364. Ain't she cute? Talking about June Star. Would you like to come be my little girl? No, I certainly wouldn't. I wouldn't live in a broken down place like this for a million bucks. Smack. Duke. She doesn't know how to talk to her elders. Ain't she cute? Does she mean ain't she cute that second time? She means you stupid little brat. Grandma. No, she's not. Children don't naturally, on their own, develop the idea or the awareness of shame. It's taught to them. But she's not taught that. Red Sam comes in, wipes his head off, and says, you can't win. These days, you don't know who to trust. Ain't that the truth? 
grandmother. People are certainly not like, not nice like they used to be. Used to be back when I was young. Two fellers come in here last week driving a Chrysler, the old beat up car, but a good one. These boys looked all right to me. Said they worked at the mill, you know. I, I let them fellers charge the gas they bought. What does he mean by he let by he let them charge it? Not the credit card. He let them charge it on the basis of he thought they looked like good, honest men. Let them fill up their car on the promise that they would return and pay. Obviously, they didn't. Why did I do that? Why did I allow them to do that? The grandmother. Because you're a good man. A good man does what towards other people? Or a good man, it is suggested, sees what? in other people. Good. There's a line in the fourth, fourth Harry Potter novel where one of the teachers sees Harry do something nice to another student. And at the end of the novel, Harry is told by this teacher, I knew you would do that. Why? Because decent people expect others to be decent. The guy who says that, by the way, is not decent. He's an evil kid. Okay? Red Sam. Yes, I suppose so. It is in a soul in this green world of gods that you can trust. And I don't count nobody out of that. Not nobody. She repeated, looking at Red Sammy. Okay. This is Red Sammy's wife saying that. I don't trust nobody in this world. And then she looks at her husband. Nobody. Oh, there's a great marriage. So the grandmother asked Red Sammy, you heard about that misfit? The wife, Red Sam's wife, I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't attack this place right here. I wouldn't be right there. And she goes on and on. Red Sammy tells her to shut up. And then Red Sammy says, a good man is hard to find. Everything is getting terrible. I remember the day you could go out and leave your screen door unattached or unlatched. That means the main door wide open and just the screen door pulled too. And when he means leave, he means leave the house, go to work, and leave the door open. Why? Pre air conditioning. Leave the door open on the front, leave the door open in the back. So the wind, the breeze blows through, and the house doesn't get too hot. Everything is getting terrible. A couple more minutes. So he and the grandmother discussed better times. The old lady said, in her opinion, Europe was entirely to blame for the way things were now. What are the way things were now, post-war? How's Europe to blame for that? Because the United States saved Europe's ass, right? If we hadn't gotten involved, it'd be gone. So how does that account for things are worse now? Well, beginning in the late 40s, we instituted what's called the Marshall Plan. We sent all kinds of stuff to Europe to help people survive. We rebuilt Europe. We rebuilt Germany to become the economic powerhouse it is. We rebuilt Japan to become the economic powerhouse it is. People here, partly, suffered for that. Why? Increased taxes to help pay for all of that. But it's not only that. O'Connor is alluding to some ideas that we're going to have to discuss on Friday when we come back and finish this. Um, start also for Friday. Read the section on the introduction to drama, right? Because we'll, we'll finish this fairly soon and then start that.